Now we move on from price expectation curve um, that we talked about in the last one to talking about approaches to pricing. Um, so we'll briefly look at cost plus, target, perceived value and competitor related. So that includes leaders and followers. Cost plus pricing is the simplest. It's, it does what it says on the tin. Uh, simplest method of pricing in which a standard or traditional percentage is added to the cost. Target pricing then is where an organization pitches price which will deliver a target overall profit or return on investment over a period. Uh, the use of break-even analysis is important here. Perceived value pricing then is the approach to pricing which is exemplified in the fish and chips um, scenario we talked about in part one. Um, components of the marketing mix, especially services mix, to build a perception of value in the mind of the per purchaser. So the ambience, uh, all the other elements uh, on top of product or how we augment the product um, will determine uh, what value the customers feel they're getting. So that high class restaurant we talked about is an example of what the market will bear or what the market will stand approach to pricing. So they charge high prices relative to other places because, um, you know, that's part of the treat uh, for their customers and a perception of quality that they will be receiving. So competitor related pricing is another one that does what it says on the tin. It's about looking at the competitors. There's no point in just charging a certain amount above costs if it's going to be completely different to what everyone else is charging and therefore cause people to wonder what's going on with that product. Is that going to be um, good or, you know, so many companies bring a product to the market in consideration of the prices which are obtainable by the players already operating. So maybe what they're charging is far too low to cover our costs and then we realize that actually we shouldn't try to compete in that market. We should go for a different end of the range or, or a different type of product. So their positioning against products determines the approach. So this is where they can become price followers, um, entrance to a market who simply follow what everybody else is doing. So just pricing just below the market leader or the just below average sometimes, something of that nature or picking dead average. Uh, price leaders then are ones who establish the going rate. So Apple can be considered a price leader in the mobile phone market um, and always kind of, you know, set their own tune, everybody else follows. Um, so a little bit more detail on cost base, cost based approaches to pricing. Bit of a mouthful there. Pricing decisions must take into account a range of uh, factors, including demand and cost. Pricing decisions must have regard for cost because the selling price of a product should exceed the average unit cost. So we looked at the earlier uh, section of um, this topic is all about looking at <coughs> making setting a minimum price below which we will not sell a product we won't go into that market if, if uh, the price has to be less than that and um, so there are some short-term exceptions to that loss leaders which are designed to attract custom for other products that are going to be more profitable so typically in a supermarket situation they may sell some items in the store at a below cost and that brings people in and they buy other things that have a that the overall profit in the basket or the trolley uh, will pay for the loss on that one product the drawback of cost based pricing is a failure to take into account the other demand factors and your competition and so on as we've mentioned already so uh, a division of cost based is full cost plus pricing 
Uh, the traditional approach to pricing products is full cost plus pricing, whereby the sales price is determined by calculating the full cost of the product. So it's not just, so let's say we're a shop and we buy in product A for a certain price and 5% is the margin and we add 5%, but full cost is not just about the um product A, it's also about the light and the heat and the store and, and um, the mortgage or rent or whatever it is. So it's it's trying to kind of assign a value um, and, and spread all those fixed costs as well onto the product. So that's where the term full cost comes from and then adding the percentage on top of that. So the term target pricing is sometimes used so they can be interchangeable uh, meaning setting a price so as to achieve a target profit or return on capital employed so it's taking into account a lot of other factors going on with the business in full cost plus pricing the full cost may be a fully absorbed production cost or it may include some absorbed administration selling or distribution overheads, uh, as I mentioned. So a business might have an idea of the percentage profit margin it would like to earn, and so it might decide on an average profit markup as a general guide for pricing decisions. The problems with cost plus pricing, there are several problems uh, with relying on a full cost plus price uh, approach to pricing, some of which have already been mentioned. Um, the need to adjust prices to market and demand conditions, budgeting output volume, which is a key factor in fixed overhead absorption rate. So we looked at um, the um, break even analysis, um, which changes depending on that selling price uh, and selecting a suitable basis for overhead absorption. Uh, so if we've got 10 products in our range, do we just divide everything by 10 and give everybody an even split of the um, those fixed costs? Or is you know one product our cash cow where we know we have most sales are coming from that and therefore it's um maybe they, that one should absorb a lot more of the overall cost structure. Yeah, you know, so these are things to be worked out and make it uh, a lot more complicated. So an important criticism is that it fails to recognize that since sales demand may be determined by the sales price, there will be profit maximizing combination of that price and demand uh, seesaw, especially where elasticity comes into play. So other criticisms of this approach um, we know how difficult it is to budget accurately and the sudden slump in demand will result in difficulties in achieving the overall profit levels that were budgeted. When a firm produces more than one product, uh, as we mentioned, the accountants have to allocate the fixed costs of production to different products and this is usually fairly subjective. It's hard to get that right. It fails to allow for competition and a full cost plus price is a means of measuring, uh, sorry, of ensuring that in the long run, a firm succeeds in covering all its fixed costs and making a profit out of revenue earned, but it is not flexible. So ideally it should be used in conjunction with one of the other methods. Apologies, just one second. So <laughs> advantages of the method, since the size of the profit margin can be varied at the management's discretion, a price in excess of full cost should ensure that um, a firm working at normal capacity will cover all its fixed costs and make a profit. So companies may benefit from this if they carry out large contracts, which must make a sufficient profit margin to cover a fair share of fixed uh, costs. So it depends on how our company is structured. Uh, if they must justify their prices to a potential customer. So, for example, large government contracts, um, they want to see the breakdown of how that um, tender price has been uh, come at and what is the overall profit margin that is expected and so on. 
Um, <clears throat> also, if they find it difficult to expect to estimate the expected demand at different sales prices, then they just slap on a percentage and hope for the best. Uh, it's a simple, quick and cheap method of um, pricing. So, uh, as I said, it it is, you know, it's useful in setting that minimum price that we mentioned in part one. And uh, and then we can use other marketing strategy to decide how far above that we uh, we might go. So in summary, it uh, the cost based approach should ensure profitability because we're always making sure that we cover our costs, but it ignores demand conditions. It ignores the competition and the full cost version assumes overheads are properly accounted for. Now, demand based approaches. So a difficulty with the demand based approach is to find a balance between theory and practice. So price theory or demand theory is based on the idea that a connection can be made between price, quantity demanded and sold and total revenue. In practice, firms might not make estimates of demand at, at different price levels, but they might still make pricing decisions on the basis of demand conditions, like broadly speaking, and the competition in the market. Some larger firms go to considerable lengths to estimate the demand for their products or services at different price levels by producing estimated demand curves. So again, the mobile phone industry would be a classic. They will be it's worth their while to spend all this time and effort and, and money because time is money. Somebody has to be assigned to do all of this calculating and gathering of information. Um, but because you're talking about billions of dollars, um, it's worth it to them to, to go through this with a fine tooth comb. Whereas uh, your regular mom and pop shop down the street, it doesn't um, it doesn't it won't pay them to go into all this detail. So the concept of price elasticity of demand we talked about in part one is a measure of the responsiveness of demand to changes in price. The percentage change in the quantity of good demand divided by the percentage change in its price. So when competitors sell exactly the same product in the same market, price differences are likely to have a significant effect on demand. So, for example, the price of gas, price of petrol at filling stations in a particular area, they're competing closely with each other. But then you go to a completely um, a different part of the country. Um, it's going to, you know, the, the, the price structures in that locality uh, might be completely different. When firms sell products that are not exactly identical or where geographic location of the sales point is significant, there is scope for charging different prices. So the, the, the station on one end of the country uh, owned and operated by the same company as another one at the, at the other end. Uh, they can charge different prices and compete at a local level uh, because they're not in competition with each other. People can't drive that long a distance to choose to to buy to fill their tank uh, from that other place. So price differences can be achieved in a number of ways through product quality, design differences. So obviously something that has superior design, styling, uh, people are willing to pay more for geographic location. So obviously, if they can't physically get to that other place or it's not worth the cost um, to go there and brand loyalty. Uh, so uh, a product that has good brand loyalty can charge more than a product just entering the market that nobody has heard of. So where a firm can sell to two or more completely separate markets, it might be able to charge a different price in each market to maximize profits because the demand in each is different. Successful price discrimination depends on the ability of the firm to prevent the transfer of goods by a third party from the cheap market to the dear market. So there are several ways in practice by which price discrimination can be exercised. So maybe we negotiate every customer 
uh, is met with a different um, marketing mix. So we negotiate price per project. So it maybe we're building contractors or, um, you know, doing large contracts, selling business to business. And so there's a lengthy negotiation that occurs with each customer. Then obviously the result is going to be different every time. The package that is offered is going to be different. Some people may want delivery. Some people may want a once a month delivery and others twice a week uh, in smaller quantities. And, you know, different different elements are, are negotiated and obviously price comes into that um, on the basis of quantity. So obviously uh, com the, the customer who is putting in huge orders can get a discount per unit compared to people buying or customers buying smaller quantities, different product types time so at different times of year we might have deals going on we might have stock clearance sales um if we're if we're a high street shop we might have sales in january and that sort of thing uh location or black friday sales so that's all time uh, differences in price according to time so when they bought it for restaurants they might have a pre theater menu for that quieter time um, before um, before six o'clock or before seven o'clock sometimes uh, in the evening and um, try to spread out the demand for um, evening dinner. Um, and location is, is kind of obvious, uh, as we mentioned already. So for price discrimination to be successful, certain market conditions must exist. Producer must enjoy a dominant position in the market as a monopolist or provider of a product which commands a high degree of loyalty. So people will be willing to pay that. Or price discrimination is ex exercised on the base of individual negotiation, geographic area and so on, the other elements on the list. Um, and so there must be no opportunity for rivals to buy the product at a cheaper price and then sell it at the dearer price to a, a different market uh, because they're going to be competing with you on those times. So the producer must also consider other factors when deciding to perhaps set different prices. Can the price differential be justified to customers? So if the customers who are paying the dearer, the more expensive price, if they find out that other customers are getting the cheaper option, is that going to cause a problem? So is it is it justifiable to those customers? Maybe the geographic area in that other location, the costs are higher for various reasons. There's import charges or all sorts of things. Is uh, price discrimination normal practice? So it's known that over there it's cheaper, whereas over here it's dearer, uh, or at that time of year it's dearer. You know, Black Friday, people expect it to be cheaper. And so if you buy the week before Black Friday, you accept that actually, you know, that you, if you wait a week, you might get a cheaper price. But if you're willing to buy it that week earlier, then you accept that maybe you're not getting the best deal. If you need it that urgently, you're willing to pay that money. And how much of a differential are you talking about? What will the customer reaction be in general? And are there price differentials, uh, are they cost based? So I mentioned sometimes in different geographic areas, there are different costs associated. <clears throat> or is it purely according to what the market will bear? Um, and, you know, if that becomes, the customers won't react too well if they find out that that's the attitude, perhaps. So other aspects um, that we're going to touch on over the next number of slides, effects of inflation, price leadership, well, we, we have touched on it, so we'll, um, uh, average price strategy, lowest price strategy, product line pricing, discount pricing, and new product pricing, all tongue twisters. So an organization should recognize the effects of inflation <clears throat> on its pricing decisions. <clears throat> when costs are rising, 
So we're currently in a period of inflation. So we should factor that in when we're setting our price because maybe we only change the prices once a year or every few years. So whatever price we set now, are we locked into that? Are we, you know, if this is a government tender, are we adequately allowing for inflation within a very tight margin that we probably are stuck with? So several guidelines for price reviews during a period of inflation. Fixed price long term contracts should be avoided. Try and go for shorter terms where we're locked in and then we'll renegotiate later on. When one organization sets its prices, it should decide how long it will be until the next review and prices should be reviewed regularly. So then we're reducing our risk. An organization cannot assume that it can pass on the cost increases to its customers <clears throat> by raising prices. In a competitive market, competitors might opt to reduce their profit margins instead and place an added emphasis on the control of costs. So looking internally. Customers might resist higher prices <clears throat> and so prices in price increases uh, would result in a fall in demand <clears throat> in some markets. When prices are reviewed, management must recognize that costs are likely to continue to rise and so the new price levels ought to anticipate future cost increases. So we should try and calculate upwards. We check the trend. Has it been increasing over, you know, uh, the last few months and what's it likely to continue to um, up to the time of the next price review? Price leadership, as we said, we mentioned it already. In some markets, there's a price leader. We mentioned Apple as an example. The price leader indicates to other firms in the market what the price will be. That means they set their own prices. They're not, they don't care what everybody else charges. They set their price. They know their customers are loyal and will pay X. They will pay this amount. So competitors then look at that price and then they set their prices with reference to that. The nature of price leadership where it exists is likely to vary from industry to industry and will depend on the number of firms within that industry. So average and lowest price strategies, you can probably figure out where we're going with this. An average price strategy and lowest price are two forms of strategy based on competitors. So it's competition based. Um, <clears throat> Average pricing might be adopted if products sold by all firms in the market are roughly the same and there's no significant di differences in quality design or product content. The company does not wish to be an aggressor in the market for fear of provoking a price war or increased competition. The attitude of customers influences pricing decisions. A lowest price strategy might be associated with market aggression or low quality. <clears throat> and you don't want to spark a price war. So when a major company in a competitive market pursues a lowest price strategy, so setting the price lower than everyone else, a price war will happen if they lower theirs to match yours. Price is often a guide to quality. And so that can have, so that's another reason not to pursue a lowest price strategy because people will think yours is the crappy product on the market if yours is the lowest price. So new product pricing, <clears throat> pricing of new products requires that principles discussed previously are considered very carefully. It has two time factors to consider, long term or short term. Short term is to get the product into the market. So uh, and then long term is uh, to ensure that it's a worthwhile venture for the company. We want to be around for a while and make money into the into the future. So price skimming involves setting a high price. This is where the mobile phone companies engage in price skimming. They're trying to maximize what they're earning. If we go back to our, um, our break even analysis, <clears throat> they're looking to make back all their fixed costs and so on within the first three months, hit break even within that three months and set um, the highest price that they can set in order to do that. And then 
they'll gradually reduce the price later on. It'll it'll start appearing as part of package deals. You get the phone and you pay this much per month and all that sort of thing. Uh, whereas penetration pricing is uh, setting the new price low in order to maximize market penetration. So a high amount of sales, high, high volume of sales. And so you're entering the market um, and getting all those sales before the competitors can enter the market. You're trying to keep them out perhaps as well um, and uh, maintain that market share. It, it's less attractive to other competitors to enter the market uh, against you if your margins are quite low already. Um, so effective market research will help making the right tactical decisions on this. And now a final couple of points <clears throat> on price fixing and predatory pricing. Ooh, excuse me. So the emotional and subjective nature of price creates many situations in which misunderstandings between the buyer and seller cause ethical problems. Monopolistic market structures, um, <clears throat> price competition may be avoided by a tacit agreement leading to concentration on non-price competition. So <clears throat> technically it might not be a monopoly. There might be many competitors in the market but if they all get together and agree the price the OPEC countries agree how much oil uh, will will be sold for uh, per barrel on the uh, international market uh, and so they create a monopoly by all sticking together and they only compete then on the non-price elements so how how often deliveries what big quantities all that sort of stuff so whether agreements exist at all is hard to prove because <laughs> they could just be using competitor based uh, approach to pricing where they look at what everybody else is charging and just charge the same. They can do that if they're not talking to each other, then it's not illegal. They, uh, you know, it's that's the, the gray area. Can you is it provable that they actually discussed this and agreed it? Um, so this is a problem for government agencies such as the Office of Fair Trading when attempting to establish if unethical pricing agreements such as price fixing occur. So the price fixing is where there is an actual agreement um, um, where, where they have, you know, clearly agreed to follow a certain price uh, structure. Um, Predatory pricing then is another uh, potential problem when a company seeks to earn high profits at the expense of customers. So, for instance, um, a shop that might be open on Christmas Day, charging four times the normal price for batteries because Santa forgot uh, to include batteries in the awesome presents and there are screaming kids back home who want to play with the toys. So the parents have gone out to find a shop, found the only shop open in the area, and they are probably going to pay that money, but they will not be happy about it. And it is not, you know, it's not an ethical thing to do. So that would be an example of predatory pricing. Anyone who's looking for batteries on Christmas day is going to pay whatever is being charged. They're desperate. Um, OK, so we will look at exam questions uh, and go through uh, answering in um, later in the uh, semester. Thank you.